Hello, welcome to Bendigo Decides. I'm Lewis Adams and here with me is Tom O'Callaghan. And we're here to talk state politics. How are you doing, Tom? Yeah, I'm doing very well, thank you. Keeping an eye on what's been going on this, this past week? Well, how can how could I not <laughs> when we have a constitutional crisis happening, or so the papers tell us? A, a, a crisis of some form, <laughs> form anyway. Now, what led to this? You know, these things just don't happen overnight, even though if you read the news, sometimes it looks like it, it did. Now, this some, something was building towards this. Well, so some something centering around a certain MP from Frankston. Yeah, Jeff Shaw. Jeff Shaw, the independent MP from Frankston, used to be part of the um, Liberal government, but um, defected last year to, well, to sit on the crossbenches, um, there was a bit of a cloud around him anyway in terms of some of his more colourful dealings with <laughs> various company cars and other things like that which have, have been investigated now for quite a while, a better part of a year. But um, as well as that, he uh, d declared a vote of no confidence in the then Premier, Ted Ballew. Um, the next day, Ted Ballew resigned. So you can imagine there's a lot of strong feelings in the Parliament between, well, Jeff Shaw and everybody else. Jeff Shaw's an ultra-conservative, which means that the Labor Party hates him. <laughs> and, and obviously there's a little bit of, slight bit of personal animosity maybe between um, Nat Thine and, and him and between Ted Ballew and, and in fact Ken Smith, the former speaker who also um, was a bit of a casualty from the same, the same war of words. He and, um, he and Jeff Shaw have had a, a lot of um, heated conversations over the past year or so and, and really they just don't like each other at all. He's a man who's definitely made a lot of enemies on all sides of politics. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> So the, the thing that um, has really triggered this, um, ever since Jeff Shaw went to the back benches, there's been this, this thing around whether he might have misused parliamentary, um, well, taxpayer money for various things. There was a, an investigation was launched, a parliamentary privileges committee investigation um, involving members of both parties to investigate whether um, there was any wrongdoing or any corruption. Uh, last week or about a week, a week and a half ago, the Parliamentary Privileges Committee handed down a report. There was actually two reports. Um, the majority report, which was the Liberal uh, members, said that, well, chef's broken the code of conduct. <laughs> <laughs> Which, you know, cardinal sin for any MP, you can't break the code of conduct, but, you know, that's neither here or there. The real issue is um, that, as far as they were concerned, was that he should repay about $7,000 for um, some taxpayer-funded car trips <laughs> and various other things that maybe shouldn't have been... Um, shouldn't have been taken or at least should have been paid for by him. The minority report said that they should find, the the minority report being the, the Labor Party's senators, uh, uh, lower house MPs, saying that this guy had basically should be found in contempt of parliament and thrown out. And that really started everything. There's been a lot of negotiations going on behind the scenes or at least conversations going on between Dennis Napthine, the Premier, and Jeff Shaw about uh, various issues, um, some of them legislative, some of them really not quite legislative, um, some of them being more judicial or maybe about Shaw's self-interest. And Jeff Shaw's been trying to negotiate into a position where he's being, he can be protected by Parliament and presumably doesn't have to pay back any money but also can cover his ass so that he stays in Parliament and maybe doesn't get taken to court. That really came to a crescendo on Tuesday. Dennis Nat finds in a car travelling around Ballarat and um, gets this text message from, from Shaw and really just cracks it, cracks a wobbly, calls up Shaw and they have a very animated 15 minute conversation on the side of a road in Ballarat in which Jeff Shaw probably came off uh, the worst for wear. He went straight onto radio on ABC Drive, I think, on um, 774 and, and said that he had wanted some form of protection from the government or some type of assurance that he wasn't going to get too badly beaten up, I guess, now in the aftermath of this report, the parliamentary privileges report coming out and he didn't get what he wanted out of the Premier so he was prepared to vote with Labor should Labor bring forward a vote of no confidence motion in the government which would um, in a minority government with you know a 44, 43, um, uh, 44 votes in Parliament for the, the Liberal Party and 43 for the Labor Party would obviously change, uh, will trigger a crisis, a crisis of massive proportions for a minority government such as Napthine's. Yeah, Shaw's in this position where he uh, holds the balance of power. 
That's right. Uh, and uh, I guess uh, you you can't you almost can't blame him for trying to use that to his advantage, especially when he is under threat. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe I mean the, I, I think but, you might get a bit you, of an you can't, you from can't, everybody else about you, that. You can't you can't say that it's the most moral <laughs> no, uh, no, course, no. course of action. No, I think well you know you look at everybody's reactions and they're they're really saying well Jeff Shaw deserves to be punished. Even Nat Thine's saying that now. There was a dramatic news conference um, on Tuesday night in which Nat Thine goes out and says we won't be held to ransom by the member for Frankston, Jeff Shaw, and then says well look you know what if the Labor Party wants to bring on a vote of no confidence motion then let it go. Let's do it. Something that Daniel Andrews is not really keen on doing. I don't think. Uh, or was let subsequent events prove that he wasn't particularly keen on that particular course of action because it means accepting a tainted vote from Jeff Shaw. It's uh, fairly close. We're, 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 what, five, six months out from the election right now? Yeah, November, end about. of November. Yep. And uh, if uh, there was this vote of no confidence, then a possible course of action could have been an early election, but that a lot of things have to line up for yep. that. Chances are that that wouldn't have happened. There's a process that would have been triggered had there have been a no confidence motion. It all starts back in 2006 when the then Brax government changed the constitutional rules to fix elections so that they now are four years, fixed four year terms rather than three. So, you know, as opposed to say federal parliament where maybe Tony Abbott could call an election whenever he wants, you know, and whenever it would be convenient for the government, there's now fixed four year terms for the Victorian government. And there's a process that would have been triggered had there have been a vote of no confidence. I don't know though, I think from memory, I think the Speaker could have voted it down. That's my assumption, they'd have a casting vote. But even if you couldn't get the numbers, Liberal Party couldn't get the numbers in Parliament, you'd still have a period, I think it's a, an eight day cooling off period I in, think which, that's right, yeah. in which the government can wheel and deal and get its way out of a position like that. They need a confidence motion. Yeah, and they need to be able to assure the Governor that, that they can govern. The Governor in this position, yeah, um, he needs to have the insurance that the assurance of the Premier, as long as he's got the assurance from the Premier that the Premier can govern, his party can govern, then government continues as usual. So it's not a constitutional crisis as such, but it's certainly it's, a legislative crisis. And it's a crisis where the Constitution is coming into play. That's right. Andrews was involved with reforms, wasn't yeah, he? I believe he was, he was Attorney General. So anyone who tells you that he was uh, that he doesn't understand the Constitution, no, that's not right. He's just uh, manoeuvring legislatively uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, when he says things, like he said, I think he said on Wednesday morning, he was going out and saying, well, maybe if Nat Thine and I went and saw the governor together. Well, no, he can't do that. But that's part of a, a series of, of uh, moves as each party tries to outmaneuver each other to both say that Shaw's awful and that um, as they try and get as much advantage as they possibly can in the media and in the parliament for themselves. Tuesday evening, this comes out. Nat Thine and Andrews both schedule uh, media conferences to re respond to this. As we mentioned earlier, Nat Thine basically said, bring it on. You know, I'm not going to be held to ransom by rogue MP from Frankston or words to that effect. And uh, then eyes turn to Andrews yeah, uh, right. later on that evening, uh, see you know, if he would take the, take the bait and call a no confidence motion. And I don't know how many people were expecting him to actually do it, but that was a possibility. Well, it's definitely a big thing. I mean, both parties have actually been preparing for this moment for the past couple of months, really. Andrews earlier in the week had been in the middle of planning sessions for the Shaw question, for trying to work out every <laughs> possible move that Shaw and Napthine might make and trying to work out a plan to go around it. They knew that, that there'd be a lot of pressure on, on the Labor Party to make up its mind about a no confidence motion pretty quickly after all of this stuff happened. I don't think they were quite expecting it to go exactly the way it was, though, where Napthine calls a press conference and... Um, um, just so so strongly comes out against Shaw and so and, and starts portraying himself as a very strong premier. You know, all of his language is now deliberately about strong premier. You look at the the conferences, the press conferences that he's had, and suddenly you, you see diff different questions coming up, and then the Shaw stuff comes up. His whole tone changes, his language changes to be strong language like "we won't be held to ransom." Um, 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 Shaw will pay the price. These really strong pieces of language. He's yep. really trying to portray himself at the moment as a strong Premier, which is, of course, in the middle of the crisis 
that's probably the best place for him to be. In the middle of a crisis in an election year, yeah. very, very much a good place. Uh, nap time might even get a bump in the polls after his the way he's handled this situation. Do you feel, I, I would take it then, you would feel that his uh, strong posture that he's taking is working? I think it's worked for the last, well, today's Sunday, the day that yep. we're recording this. I think it's worked right up till now. I think that we've seen him uh, show that he's in control, show that he's... he's um, certainly dictating the way the conversation is going. And that's what you want. You don't want the opposition really creating a tone in the debate of chaos. You need to have a strong language coming out. You need to be able to show that you're willing to knock this awful short character off his perch. Uh, and that's certainly the, the way it looks like it's going to be going. I don't think that, for example, you see the majority report from the Parliamentary Pri Privileges Committee. I don't think that it'll just be sure having to pay back money. He's looking pretty strong and he's going pretty strongly in terms of his language so it's looking more and more likely I think like sure will get suspended from parliament at the very least. It was very much something that Naphthine needed for his image. Yeah absolutely well you know <laughs> you've got the entire <laughs> state looking at you probably the entire nation looking at you for a moment and you've got that moment to seize which he's done I think quite well. I think too that you know there's always a question around state MPs anyway about whether they're boring and so it means that when they become leader you get this oh yeah this boring stuff. Naphthine was opposition leader oh, years and years ago and he never made any real headway he was just seen as the boring kind of nerdy doctor type um, <laughs> <laughs> and and certainly when he he was a, um, appointed after ted Ballew, when people were saying well you know if you had a problem with ted Ballew getting through to people then napthine's probably not your man but um I think he's shown he's able to very strongly set the tone and agenda for the state and, and looks like a leader, looks like a strong, fearless leader. Let's talk about Andrews now. Probably going into this crisis, he was leading in the polls. Yep. And uh, this has gone down and he has decided not to push a vote of no confidence in the current premiership. You, you were saying that this is probably a decision that they had already come to, or at the very least, they decided what circumstances need to go down to push for a vote of no confidence. What, what do you think of that? Well, I don't think he should have accepted Shaw's vote, so he's right not to, because it is a tainted vote. It's trying to force an election because essentially one man is trying to save himself from, from you know, some fairly problematic legal questions for himself. So I don't think he could say anything like that. But what he also did during the week was, first of all, he guaranteed supply of the budget, which is a big thing because it means that Parliament won't grind to a halt. Um, and he started talking about bipartisanship stuff. He's basically trying to, um, you, know, you know, we were talking before, I uh, mentioned before, he said on, I think it was Wednesday morning, oh, you know, Dennis, you and I should go down to, to the, um, the Governor-General's office while he's trying to dictate the part bipartisanship stuff on his terms. He wants to be in the photo or he wants to be in everything, say, talking about bipartisanship and setting himself up so that, well, perhaps he could say at some point, well, we tried to be bipartisan, but, you know, look at Dennis Naphtal and he's just, you know, he's, you know, he's just not coming along with us and so we'll change our minds and maybe, I don't think they would go to a, a, an election early, but maybe reject the budget. But he's in a position at the moment where really I, I think that he's under more pressure than um, personally, I think he's under more pressure and feeling the pressure more than, say, Dennis Napthine. There was a, a comment in, in the paper. A, one of the journalists overheard a, a photographer during Napthine's press conference saying, oh, he's not even breaking a sweat. I really wanted him to break a sweat. Napthine's pretty confident. You look at pictures of, say, of Andrews, he looks nervous. <laughs> he looks <laughs> like he's feeling the way of the world at the moment. You can just see that if you have a look at the covers of the uh, newspapers on um, Wednesday morning. Um, if you look at uh, the Herald Sun, you know, there's this image of Naptine. He's just sort of in this very strong pose. I, I don't recall the exact headline, but... I think it was block letters saying, we won't be held to ransom, or yes. I, I won't be held to ransom. Yes, on the other side of the media fence, The Age. Uh, it was a bit more neutral. It was more, more along the lines of Naptine under attack, but even then, it was very hard to actually capture in, in these in these pictures of a weak-looking Naptine. No, not at all. In fact, he's I think he's, he's really running the, the conversation at the moment, which is what you want, I think, in a crisis, if you're a government, you want to be able to say that you're confidently handling situations. What the opposition wants is a long-term win. It wants, well, this week it needs to do stuff, and it's planning to do stuff, I would imagine, but also to set an overall tone for this debate so that it carries through to the, the elections. They want to get as much ammunition against the government out of this crisis as they can really get. Yep, yep, absolutely, and, and let it go as, as long as they can. To talk about minority governments, too, because... 
I'll tell you, I, I don't think Australians are quite comfortable with the idea of minority governments. Victorians, are, I think, um, find this kind of stuff frustrating. Um, they don't like seeing weak premiers or, or oppositions that, that are trying to, to bring down governments. And so there's this fine line that Andrews has to tread and the fine line that Nathan has to tread. It's not like, say, where governments in the lower house of parliaments are, are trying to get legislative agenda through an upper house where they don't have the support. This is in a lower house where the weakness of, of governing is, and I don't think Victorians really like that a whole lot, so it creates a tone anyway and opportunities to, to fight and, and to point out how weak um, a government is on its own legislative agenda. It's going to take a, a big turn of events for Labor's best chance to be to get back into the Premiership to be anything other than waiting for November. What I think you're going to see this week is it all comes down to Tuesday because on Tuesday Andrews wants to force a debate and, and force the expulsion of Shaw from Parliament. He wants to see him completely gone. The Labor Party wants to see him completely gone. Partly because people are talking about in terms of abortion. Shaw's got some abortion stuff that they want to talk about, but I think that that's neither here nor there. I think they just want him gone. They want to force him to be gone before the budget is passed too, because they want to be able to uh, have bragging rights, <laughs> whereas I think the government would like to see the budget passed first. I don't think that's going to happen. So I think on Monday you'll start to see Andrews popping up all over Victorian media, trying to get as much mileage as he can for this big debate, yep. and then the debate Debate happens and well whatever happens during the debate whether Shaw is just forced to pay a little bit of money or what I think is more likely is he'll get suspended from Parliament that's an end result that's a, a good result for the ALP because well it means a lot of things but for immediately what it means is that the, the government has agreed that, that Shaw shouldn't be in Parliament and therefore Frankston won't have an elected representative and that just reflects badly on everyone but I think it's most damaging to um, to the government because it was the Liberal Party that selected Shaw in the first place yep. who helped finance Shaw to get into Parliament and, and it'll be them who got rid of effectively got rid of him and left people of Frankston without without effective representation for, well, what is it, five, six months? About five, about five or six months, yeah. Do you think, um, even, even with all that going on, it's more valuable to the Liberal government to get rid of Shaw as well, well think, than to lose his potential vote for the next few months? Well, I mean, you've got to look at it. <laughs> the greater <laughs> picture is that... Yeah. That if you you take Shaw's vote, it is a tainted vote, and that's yep. the problem that the government's had for well, a good six or eight, uh, 12 months. They would have actually liked to call an election earlier. I, I suspect. I suspect Nat Thine would have liked to have come in, had a couple of months in the job, and then had an election to try and, and give it mandates for various things, but also to to cement his own legitimacy. But he couldn't do that because of fixed fourteen elections. So he had to accept this Shaw vote. I think too, you know, personally, from the the idea of a strong leader, um, Nat Thine. I guess he's talking um, about being a strong leader, and unless you then get rid of Shaw, I don't know how you maintain that that strong line of not being held to ransom. I think that he has to at least suspend the guy. I think that yep. he has to at least lock him out of Parliament and not allow him to push his own self-interested agendas in the House. Let's dial ourselves back a few months. Yeah, Shaw's just gotten in trouble. He's being told he in in he's being told the reports are coming in. The Liberal government, the the Liberals want him to pay back that seven thousand dollars. The Labor want to oust him. He chose the course of events that, in part, led to here yeah, trying to fight against this. What do you think would have happened if he had just turned around and said, "Look, sorry guys, my bad. If you'll accept it, I'll pay back the seven thousand dollars." Can we just keep going? I think he could have said, I think he could have said quite clearly, look, you know, if at, at any point along this process he could have said, look, you know, some of these rules are confusing. The What what parliamentarians pay for and what taxpayers pay for can be very confusing, particularly if you are, say, an independent and you've got a limited staff and you've got to kind of work yep. these things out yourself. You could have said, look, you know, it turns out that I unintentionally did something wrong. I could have paid the money back, but that's not really what this is about. This is about a, a vendettas, personal vendettas yeah. against, well, against primarily it all started because of Ken Smith. He didn't like the speaker, Ken Smith. They had arguments and it just exploded into this really over-the-top, you know, hatred. It led to Shaw saying, oh, well, in that case, you know, since they're siding with the speaker, I won't, you know, I won't support the coalition. And so he left. <laughs> you know, there's, a, there's something interesting I, I read somewhere interestingly in the age he's got this personality where I, I, he, he's got a big ego and he's also very quick to assume that to, to be the victim to feel as it, to feel that he's the victim of things when a lot of the time he actually brings these things on himself <laughs> 
So, well, you know, at any point he could have said no, but it's too late now. It's too late because he, he went to the brink and went past it yep. on, um, on, on Tuesday afternoon and, and now he'll just have to pay for it, I think. Yeah. He's pay for it in, in all kinds of ways. Pay the price, as Nat Thine is saying at the moment. He, he's gotten to this point where he's made an enemy of the Labour Party. He's made an enemy of the Liberal Party, which for an MP is not a good position to be in. <laughs> And um, now no one wants him around. I think that this ends up in court. As far as Shaw's, Shaw's going, it's just one of those things where he's going to go to the court with lawyers in tow and just try and talk his way out of it that way. Um, I think that's why the Liberal Party, or part of the reason why the Liberal Party's not quite ready to say, let's suspend the guy or let's expel the guy from Parliament. <laughs> why, even though you've got this really strong response coming from the Premier, you still have this thing of, well, you know, let's not have the debate on Tuesday. Let's just try and leave it for a little bit longer and a little bit longer, partly because they want to pass the budget and they'd yep. like to pass the budget on their terms. They don't want to wait for what they think of as Labor's thought bubble to, to do this stuff on Tuesday, <laughs> this big vote. I mean, they, they just want to try and, and make sure that their case is rock solid because they lose. They look like they're in trouble, like there's chaos, like they're the idiots who couldn't keep Shaw in control. If Shaw goes to the federal court with lawyers in tow and starts, I think it's the circus, a high court circus, as um, Nat Thine is talking about at the moment. I guess, I guess it all comes down to what uh, is going to happen on Tuesday, what Daniel Andrews is going to do and say. Yeah. We can't do much to speculate what's going to happen after that. No, no. At this, at this point, what do you feel Daniel Andrews' best course of action on Tuesday is? I think he should he should try and get Parliament to expel the guy. I think they possibly could do it if they can get Ken Smith, the former Speaker, on site. And there's lots of speculation at the moment about whether Ken Smith crosses the floor to vote on this. Uh, has Ken himself been saying that, or has just uh, yeah, he, there's been heavy speculation? He's stoked some speculation, if that makes sense. <laughs> um, so look, he I. I I think it's still pretty unclear whether he's going to vote along party lines or not. Um, he's out for blood now, as much as Shaw is, as much as Andrews is, as much as Nathine is. Really, it's about whether Ken Smith can be convinced not to cross the floor, I think, yeah. is actually the, it, the it, question. It won't surprise me if he does, and I think, um, if anything, the events of the past week just cemented his decision, if, yeah. he, if he is or if he has, this, in fact, decided so. to cross the floor. Yeah, I should think so. And for Nathine, I mean, as far as what Nathine gets out of it, I guess he's got to keep talking about strong leadership, and really, this is the the pointy end now of all this talk last week of strong leadership is he going to be a strong leader who who doesn't let this you know little fly you know get in the way of him he swats it away this rogue MP yeah. from Frankston or whether he asses it up and looks weak and that's a big issue at the moment that's probably the biggest challenge for Napthine and Shaw is just definitely not giving him the the most cooperative attitude anyway he's, <laughs> he's right. when asked you do do you understand this course of action could bring down the government and he said life will go on yeah. Yeah. <laughs> if if anything encapsulates his attitude, it's it's that one right there. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And I think that by now it's probably been apparent to Shaw for months and months that this issue gets sorted out in the court. If he's going to have some um, a resolution that's in any way good for him, it's going to happen in federal courts. This has been Bendigo Decides for another time. Uh, thank you, Tom. Oh, thank you, Lewis. Uh, you can find us on Twitter at the New Local, or if you want to talk to Tom at Tom Bendigo. Remember to go to www.thenewlocal.net where you can find this podcast, old podcasts of this podcast, so we can find some articles, and my other podcast series, which I only just put up the first episode a couple days ago. Oh, wonderful. Uh, local Chats. That's, that's, that should be a good one. It's less on the politics side of things, but you know, if you found it interesting hearing me talk at all, then <laughs> I'm sure you'll find that, that interesting as well. Thank you. No, thank you. Goodbye.